At Tri-State Worship Center, our aim isn't to be the best church in the community, but to be the best church for the community. We're here to encourage the saints, help the hurting, and embrace all people. At Tri-State Worship Center, there's a ministry for everyone. So if you're looking for a place to grow and serve others, or just need some additional encouragement, we've got you covered. casual and very friendly. You'll barely make it through the door without being greeted with a smile and a handshake or even a hug. about a dress code. We don't have one. The important thing is that you come. So come in what you have and we'll go from there. It's our vision to be a beacon, a light, a celebration of hope, a hope that we can only find in Jesus. We only ask one thing. You've tried it your way. Why not give his way a try? We'll see you at church. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Happy, Easter. Happy Easter. And after one year, your chair is connected to the one next to you. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Same thing. Matter of fact, we may need to get some more of them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, my name is Pastor Terry. This is my lovely wife, Vicki. We're just excited to have you here with us on this great Easter Sunday. Amen? Woo. Amen. So hello everyone on Facebook. Uh, be sure and like and share and happy Easter to you also. All right. I know this is a little unorthodox, but you know, we're just going to ask you if you're a first time guest, just raise your hand just wave until at us someone real quick. puts something in first it. First time here. Just, just keep, hand up. All keep right. waving until you get that yeah, $100 wait, dollar bill in your you hand. Go. There you go. Right here we go. Okay. <laughs> Look under your seat. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. Let's just get that out of the way right now. <laughs> Not really. All really right. We were lying about okay. that. Okay. Hey, hurry. All right. Keep your hands up. I'm sorry. Keep your hands up. We're, until, we're getting reinforcements. <laughs> until they stick a bag in your hand. Keep awesome. your hand up. Thanks, guys. You look awesome. Would yes, you just look at welcome. your welcome. Enjoy the service. Look at your neighbor right now and just say, You look marvelous. You look marvelous. <laughs> We, okay. At Tri-State Worship, Sammy, you're not new, although the tie looks new, and it makes you look like a new man. You look, you look marvelous. You really do. We're not going to stop the service here in a little bit and take up an offering. We don't do it that way. We just ask you to drop your tithe, your offering, your building fund commitments, your missions giving into these boxes that are on the wall located throughout the building. Or you can go to our website, tswc.org. Or if you're on Facebook, you can hit Shop Now. It'll take you to our giving page. If you're here in the building, you can also swipe your card at the kiosk that's out in the foyer. However you do it, we need you to do it so that we can continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen.
She had no faith. Okay. Anybody did not get a bag first time gift? I saw a hand right gift. over here. I saw a little guy Right with there his... in the back. There you go. All right. Maybe two of them. You might two. need two of them. All right. Maybe. We'll get you. Okay. Prayer request this morning. Paul Winkler, Ann Shaw, Elmer May Sr., Rhonda Kinney Vance, Liam Rife, Linda Collins, Chuck Lavender, K.O. Wilson, Lucian Kimler, Gabriel, Jim Pinkerman, Amanda Willis, Pat Cherry, Carson Thompson, Mose Thacker, Lily Riley, Jerry Toller, Sonny Hogsett, Melvin Endicott, Carl Vaughn, April Vaughn, Rich Karoma, Karomiak, Karomiak. I get it, Rich. Jack Howe, Scott Williamson, Bill Clark, the Hay family, Brenda Perry, Jack Taylor family, and Brian Roach. Amen. Let's stand. Listen, if there's next to you and you're not practicing distancing, I need you to scoot over just a little bit. We still got people coming in. And I, I set up 70 more chairs than what we normally have in here because uh, we do two services on Sunday, 9, 30, and 11. But we're still, you know, Larry, Larry Medcalf and Stacy, they're fashionably late. And so they needed a place to... <laughs> With his Easter shirt on. But anyway, if you could do that for us. And then uh, we've also got some guys who are going to grab some chairs if we need them. But I think it's better to sit closer together than it is to get chairs. And Yeah, amen. So you have a special need this morning? Let me see your hand. Amen. Lots of needs, but we serve a big God. Amen. amen. Do we serve a big God? Amen. Let's pray and ask him to help us today. Lord, thank you for today. This is the day that you've made for us. We're just going to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Lord, that uh, he's alive, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And we're here to celebrate that, not just today, but every day. I pray that as we're here, that you would just supply the needs according to your riches and glory through Christ, whether they were on our prayer list or uh, represented by an uplifted hand, we know that you're able to do all things. We pray for those who have given the offering. Pray that you'll multiply that offering for the upbuilding of your kingdom and give us wisdom in how to best disperse those funds to continue to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. This morning, we love you, we bless you, we praise you, and we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. In his name alone, we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled, he's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. 
His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. Imagine, if you will, a world. A world torn between belief and doubt. Now, imagine a building. And inside this building, a courtroom. And in this courtroom, it is debated whether or not the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually did take place. You are the jury. You will decide as we make a case for Easter. Good morning. It's my pleasure this morning to present to you a case that is the state of humanity and to serve as a prosecutor in this very important manner. For over 2,000 years now, the defendant in this matter would like you to believe in a story that is nothing more than a folklore. At the conclusion of this case, and after you have heard the evidence, we are confident that you will return a guilty plea, a guilty verdict in the spreading of false hope. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it pleases the court this morning for me to present you with this evidence that is nothing more than facts. I want to present you with an evidence that he will not be able to provide because he will not be able to give you any facts of what he has to say this morning. We're confronted with a belief system that has to do with the person of Jesus and more specifically the death, burial, and resurrection of this man. We're asked to put some, what some would see as eternity on the line. But if you ask me, God did not create people. People created God. I want you to look at four specific truths this morning that I'm going to present to you. The first one would be the execution of Jesus. Now, there is no evidence that Jesus was dead. The truth is, there are some that claim that Jesus did not die on the cross. And if he did not die on the cross then he did not raise from the dead. And if he did not raise from the dead, then Christian beliefs simply fall apart. From the holy book of the Muslims, it reads in the Quran, speaking of Jesus, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. Rami Savan, a Hindu priest and teacher, says that the resurrection of a physical body is a nonsense and biological impossibility. Resurrection is a necessity in order to believe in Christianity. And most of the most intelligent, rational scholars are only adherents, they pay in poetic lip service to unscientific dogma. Even the liberal leaning think tank, the Jesus Project, Jesus Seminar agreed that Jesus died on the cross, but they leave him in the tomb and that Jesus is dead. So if the execution of Jesus is only suspect, then Christianity doesn't exist. Also, I would like to present to you the early evidence, the writings, or the Bible, as some say. These ancient writings, they're not reliable. The New Testament is fanciful religious texts that cannot be trusted. It's not a reliable source for understanding the life and teachings of this, this historical figure that we call Jesus of Nazareth. 
The so-called eyewitness testimonies of Jesus' resurrection were contrived and falsely reported and was nothing more than apostolic propaganda. Yes, a person named Jesus existed, and he seemed to have existed in the first century. But the New Testament's descriptions of him depart from any histor historical, carnal, or truth and develop legendary, divine, hero, healer status as part of only Christian myth. If an accurate portrayal of Jesus of Nazareth is to be seen, it must be constructed with historical and reliable evidence from archaeological finds, from historical criticism, and maybe, cautiously, the New Testament text. This comprehensive, critical approach to the New Testament dismisses key Christological points, such as his virgin birth, his divine nature, and the resurrection, all at once. And even if there was evidence of this crucifixion and Jesus' death, then how can anyone truly believe that he rose from the dead? Thirdly, I'd like to point you to the claim of the empty tomb. An empty tomb is very easy to explain. For instance, it was unusual for a body to be removed from the cross that quickly after death. The typical Roman procedure was to leave the body on the cross to let the corpse rot and for animals to come and feed on that body. So what if, when Joseph removed Jesus' body from the cross, he discovered that Jesus was not dead? And if Joseph knew that, then he would be put to death because he took a criminal off the cross, and he would fear that the Romans would therefore discover that he had rescued a condemned man. So if we're going to believe the theory of the resurrection, there's other theories that I pose to you that could be also true. The stolen body theory, the swoon theory, the hallucination theory, the mistaken identity theory, the copy of a pagan myth theory, the wrong tomb theory, the twin theory, the alien theory, the contradiction theory, and in that list of theories is the theory of the resurrection. Lastly, I want to present to you the eyewitnesses. This argument is simple and short. Here in 2021, I can honestly tell you there are zero witnesses to the claim that Jesus rose from the grave. There will be no question after hearing the defense's evidence that the Christian celebration of Easter is based on nothing more than not the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but folklore, myth, and legend. I appreciate your attention this morning. Your Honor, Jury, thank you for being here this morning to help us to decide a verdict in this important matter. Thank you, Mrs. Prosecutor, for helping me make my case this morning. We're faced with two particular questions that we need to try to answer this morning. One is, is Jesus the Son of God? And if he made that claim and he is the Son of God, did he raise from the dead to prove that he's the Son of God? Some have said that Jesus never claimed to be divine. Some have said that it was an early church father that made up that claim. A popular narrative goes like this. Jesus was not God. He claimed to be just a regular man. And that later, his followers decided to attribute to him some particular characteristics that were like semi-divine, like angel-like. And then it was the fourth century at the Council of Nicaea where the church fathers decided to begin to conceive Jesus as a one and only creator God of the universe. Well, it's worth noting that some very early Christian sources outside of the New Testament don't at all seem to be confused about whether Jesus was God or not. Let me run through them real quickly. Ignatius, he was the bishop at the church of Antioch and a disciple of the apostle John. In his letter to Ephesians, he wrote this, for our God, Jesus the Christ, was conceived by Mary according to God's plan, both from the seed of David and of the Holy Spirit. What about Polycarp? Polycarp was the bishop at Smyrna and another disciple of the apostle John. And here's what he wrote 
to his letter to the church at Philippi. Now may the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and in truth. Justin Martyr was a Christian apologist in the second century. Here's what he boldly states. And that Christ being Lord and the God and God, the Son of God, and appearing formerly in power as man and angel, and in the glory as of the fire at the bush, and so also manifested at the judgment executed on Sodom. What about Irenaeus? He was the bishop born in Smyrna of Asia Minor, Minor, where he studied under the bishop Polycarp, who we've already established, studied under John the Apostle. Here's what he said. He received testimony from all that he was very man and that he was very God. From the Father, from the Spirit, from the angels, from the creation itself, from men, and even from apostate spirits and demons, they knew he was the Son of God. What about Clement of Alexandria? Clement was another early church father. Here's what he said. The Word, then, the Christ, the cause of both our being at first For he was in God, and of our well-being, this very word has now appeared as man, and he alone being both, both God and man. I don't see the confusion there. What about Tertullian, an early church Christian apologist? And here's what he said. For God alone is without sin, and the only man without sin is Christ, since Christ is also God. Hippolytus, a third century theologian. He was a disciple of Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. Here's what he writes. The Logos alone of this God is from God himself, wherefore also the Logos is God, being the substance of God. And then finally, we have Origen. Origen was another early Christian theologian. Here's what he said. Jesus Christ, in the last times divesting himself of his glory, became a man and was incarnate, although God. And while he, made a man remain, while he was a man, he remained God, which he was. I don't see the confusion there. I don't see anybody guessing whether Jesus was the Son of God or not. As a matter of fact, as early as 35 A.D., all the way up to 250 A.D., 50 years before the Council of Nicaea, it was known that Jesus was the Son of God. And while these are outside sources, outside of the New Testament, what does Jesus say about himself? What kind of claims does Jesus make about his divinity? Not only the claims that he makes, but the things that he does that only divinity could do. Mark chapter 2, we have the story of the paralyzed man. And Jesus looked at him and said, that I heal you, but also your sins are forgiven. What was the response of the religious people of the day? They got mad. They said, only God can forgive. And so they accused Jesus of blasphemy because he claimed to do divine things. John chapter 8, Jesus is defending himself after the Jews said to him, wait a minute, you're not 50 years old yet. How can you have seen Abraham? Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. I am. Isn't that how God describes himself to Moses? I am. What about Mark chapter 14? Jesus is facing the Sanhedrin, a Jewish council, if you will. Verse 61, the high priest asked Jesus if he is the Christ, the son of the blessed one. And here's what Jesus said, I am. And you will see me sitting at the right hand of the mighty one, which was a reference to Psalm 110 written thousands of years before. Jesus also referred to himself as the Son of Man, which some people would say, well, that shows that he was human, not divine. But the reality is if you backtrack to Daniel chapter 7, you'll find out that that's a divine divine title for a divine figure. So Jesus' claims were crystal clear. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, the Father and I are one. Even Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? All throughout the Gospels, Jesus' divinity is crystal clear. It's as if he said, I am God. He made it clear that he was a son of God, and because of that, he was accused of blasphemy. 
Blasphemy, doing things that only divinity can do. Well, the claim of blasphemy is proven wrong if the act is true. So if Jesus claims to be the Son of God, and then they executed him, and then he rose from the dead, that's a pretty good indicator that his claim was true. So I appreciate our prosecutor bringing up these four particular pieces of evidence because the resurrection is the centerpiece of Christianity. If the resurrection is false, if Christianity is refuted, then we should just walk away. We shouldn't be here. But the truth of the matter is, I want to share with you four facts establishing convincingly that Jesus rose from the dead. Number one, execution. I promise you this morning, and the evidence will bear it out, Jesus was dead. Some claim that he didn't die on the cross and that he was resuscitated in the tomb, pointing not to divine resurrection, but a fortuitous resuscitation. But I have to tell you this morning, before he was crucified, Jesus was flogged twice. You say, how can you say that? Well, in the Roman times, there were three levels of flogging. One was kind of like a least severe flogging where they would uh, flog someone for a light offense, give them a warning, send them away, tell them don't do that again. If someone did a more serious crime, they had a more serious flogging. But then there was this most brutal level of flogging that was given to people that had been convicted and was uh, going to be put to death. As a matter of fact, that particular flogging was so brutal that many times the victim would die before they got him to the cross. You say, how can you say that this morning? Well, I look at the four gospels and putting all the points together shows us very clearly that Pilate threatens to flog Jesus and then to release him. And that particular scripture, John chapter 19, the word for flogging is the Greek word mastigo, which is that lightest level of flogging. Notice there's no sentencing at this point. This was not meant as a chastisement. This was meant just as a warning. We're going to lightly flog you. Don't do that again. Now go away. But then in Mark chapter 15, we're told that wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas and then had Jesus flogged. The Greek word there, fragello, is the most brutal kind of flogging. The flogging that left the victim with just enough strength to carry a cross. So from this, we can safely assume that there were two floggings, a light one given to appease the Jews and a far more brutal one given to Jesus that was going to lead to crucifixion. And while the Old Testament tells us that flogging was supposed to only be 39 lashes, there's no reason for us to believe the Romans would abide by what the Bible says. I'm sure it was more than 39. It's mostly unlikely that they followed that particular rule. So why is that important? Why bring that up in this case? Well, all of us should understand the sheer physicality of the torture and we should be profoundly moved that Jesus endured all that for you and for me. As a matter of fact, William Edwards, a medical doctor, said in the Journal of American Medical Association, he said this, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Even a Christian historian named Eusebius, he said this, the sufferer's veins, speaking of the one being flogged, the sufferer's veins would be laid bare and the very muscles, tendons, and bowels of the victim were laid to open exposure. So Jesus is flogged twice. And then the Bible describes what happens next, the greatest act of love that the world has ever seen. And the Bible describes it in three words. They crucified him. There's a word that's birthed out of crucifixion, out of the pain of crucifixion. It's the word excruciating. If you look up the definition of the word, it'll say out of the cross. It was so painful, so brutal, that there is no record of anyone ever surviving a Roman crucifixion, ever. After being flogged severely, they lead him up the hill. They cross, crucify him by placing a spike in his wrist, spike in his ankles, 
Fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 22 and 16 where it said, They have pierced my hands and my feet. As the victim is on the cross, he has to push up on that spike in his ankles to try to get a breath. And then he has to release that and hang by the spikes in his wrist to exhale that breath. And eventually, the result of death is carbon monoxide poisoning because they cannot exhale the air that has turned poisonous in their body. As they're there trying to breathe, as they're there pushing up on the spike in the ankles and releasing with the spike on the wrists, if it was taking too long for them to die, it was customary at the time for the Roman soldiers to come by and shatter the shin bones of the victim so they could not push up any longer. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. Already dead. So what did they do? Well... John chapter 19, verse 34 says, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately, blood and water came out. Skip down to verse 36. It says, for these things were done so that the scriptures could be fulfilled from Psalm 34 and 10, that not one of his bones shall be broken. So there's no doubt Jesus was dead. You cannot fake the inability to breathe for very long. And the spear in the side, that would have been it. The soldiers themselves would not have allowed Jesus to survive because the punishment to them would have been death. If they would have allowed someone to survive the cross, the soldiers themselves would be put to death. And if Jesus had survived and didn't die, can you imagine what he looked like physically? I'm pretty sure that wouldn't motivate anybody to follow him and risk their lives for him. Dr. William Edwards again said clearly, the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. The most liberal New Testament scholar from the Jesus Seminar that was mentioned by our prosecutor, Dominic Crossan, he said this, Jesus' death by execution under Pontius Pilate is as sure as anything historical can ever be. If that's not good enough for you, there's an agnostic guy named James Tabor. Here's what he said. I think that we need to have no doubt that given Jesus' execution by Roman crucifixion, that he was truly dead. And if that's not good enough for you, how about an atheist who is a New Testament scholar who said this, Gerd Ludman said, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. From an atheist, I submit to you this morning, jury, Jesus Christ of Nazareth was indeed dead. Secondly, we have early evidence, those early reports, those early accounts. Some say it's easy to turn this into just legend, a legend that the first century Christians just kind of rallied around. But the simple fact is we have a creed. A creed is something that is a set of beliefs and aims which people will live their lives by. And in Christianity, that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, written by the Apostle Paul. Here's what it says. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, which is Simon Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, some of them still alive to this day, some of them have passed. And after that, he was seen by James, and then all the apostles. And then Paul says, last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of due time. This creed is something that Paul says, I received it. It's important for you to catch that. I received it, past tense, and I'm passing it on to you unchanged. And if you don't believe me, ask Simon Peter, ask James, ask the 500. Now, go with me for just a minute. Jesus is crucified somewhere between 30 and 33 A.D., Paul writes the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 25 years later. But before he could write it, it had to have existed. Paul did not make it up. He passed on what he had received. And let me remind you, the first two autobiographies of Alexander the Great were written 400 years after he lived yet they are accepted as accurate and reliable. So 20 to 25 years should be more than acceptable. 
Yet one to three years, follow me here, one to three years after Jesus' death, Paul has his Damascus Road conversion. And most people believe that that's when Paul received the creed. That's when he received the creed, one to three years after Jesus' death. No time gap. No time for it to become legend. As a matter of fact, I'd say according to the first century, this is the equivalent to a newsflash. There was a book written called Jesus Remembered by James G.G. Dunn. Here's what he said. This tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' death. I mean, think about it. The belief that made up the creed goes back to the cross itself. There's no time gap for extortion. There's no time for legends to be formed. Jesus was executed. He was dead. And the early evidence is not a legend. But then that leads me to the third piece of evidence, and that is the empty tomb. Let me pause right here and just say, according to Guinness's World Book of Records, this guy was the most successful lawyer that ever lived. He actually won, as a defense attorney, 245 murder trials in a row. In a row. Knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth, became a judge on the highest court of the land. Sir Lionel LeCou was a skeptic. He grew up in a nominal Christian home. He was skeptical about whether Jesus really did rise from the dead. But then he decided to take this monumental legal skill of his and apply it to the historical data of the resurrection so that he could come up with some definitive answer. Now listen, if anyone knew what constitutes reliable evidence, it was Sir Lionel. He knew how to spot every possible loophole. He knew how to test facts to see whether they withstood scrutiny. As a matter of fact, I would say he's a guy that would be very hard to pull the wool over his eyes. And after his legal investigation, here's what he came up with. He said, I say unequivocally the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. A professor of history at Oxford University, his name's author, author, author Thomas Arnold, he said, I know of one fact in history of mankind, which is proved by either, be I know of no one fact in the history of mankind, which is proved by better evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given us that Christ died and rose from the dead. The historical record tells us that Jesus died on the cross, that his body was removed for burial by Joseph of Arimathea, that a, Joseph was a member of the Jewish council called the Sanhedrin, the tomb was sealed and it was guarded by Roman soldiers. Yet on that first Easter Sunday morning, it was discovered empty. It was an empty tomb. Now, some skeptics say, well, it was empty because the body was never in there to begin with. And they assert, as though, as our prosecutor asserted a minute ago, that the Romans did not permit the burial of those that were executed, included those that were crucified. But let me just quote from a summary of Roman practice and procedure of the era known as the Roman Digesta. It says this, the bodies of those who are condemned to death should not be refused to their relatives. And the divine Augustus in the 10th book of his life said that this rule had been observed. At present, the bodies of those who have been punished are only buried when this has been requested and permission granted. And sometimes it's not permitted, especially where persons have been convicted of high treason. Even the bodies of those who have been sentenced to be burned can be claimed in order that their bones and their ashes, after having been collected, may be buried. The bodies of persons who have been punished should be given to whoever requests them for the purpose of burial. And over the last several thousands of years, there's been archaeological discoveries of skeletal remains with spikes in the ankles and spikes in the wrists and olive wood in the the remains, which proves that victims were allowed to be buried. 
Besides, think about this. Pilate would have had an insurrection on his hands had he left a body on the cross during Passover. Jerusalem is full of Jewish believers, millions, some tell us. And if Pilate would have decided to leave Jesus' body on the cross, therefore giving us an empty tomb, that would not have fared well for Pilate. So let me share with you three lines of evidence that they converge to convince us that the tomb was empty. Number one, we call it the Jerusalem factor. The Jerusalem factor goes like this. The site of the tomb was known by Christians and non-Christians as well as the Jews. If it were not empty, it would have been highly unlikely for a movement to be founded on the resurrection and for that movement to explode in the same city that Jesus was executed. As a matter of fact, if Jesus' body was still in that tomb, it would have surely been exhumed and paraded through the streets. And the Jewish and Roman authorities would have been able to squash that Christian movement then. If a body's produced, then there's no resurrection. If a body's produced, then there's no proclamation. Which leads us to the second line of evidence for an empty tomb, and that's called the criterion of embarrassment. Here's what it means. One way to determine truth is, is, is if, the details are in, if the details that are included would embarrass the person themselves or would hurt their cause. Now think about this. Why would you include embarrassing facts unless it's true? You say, well, what's an embarrassing fact? Well, who discovered the tomb? Women. Matthew 28 Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. They found it empty. Here's the problem with that. In the first century, Jewish and Roman culture, both women were lowly esteemed. As a matter of fact, their testimony was considered questionable. It was not considered credible. They were not even allowed to testify in court. As a matter of fact, the Jewish Talmud says this, any evidence which a woman gives is not valid to offer. Matter of fact, (laughs) Roman culture, the historian Josephus wrote this, but let not the testimony of a woman be admitted on account of the levity and the boldness of their sex. So the point is this, if you're going to make up a false story about a tomb being empty, there's no way that you would say women discovered it. There's no way you'd do that. It would hurt your case among the very people that you were trying to to convince, unless it was true. You see, the gospel writers were committed to writing what really happened, even if it meant embarrassing themselves. Here's the third line of evidence, maybe the most persuasive. It's called enemy attestation. In other words, what are the opponents of Jesus and the enemies of Christianity? What are they saying about an empty tomb? Well, I can tell you what they never said. They never said, go open the tomb, the body's there. They never said that. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 28, we can read, when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying to them, go tell them the disciples came at night and stole away his body while we slept. What is that? Cover up. It's a cover story. They conceded the tomb was empty, but they tried to explain how it got empty. It's like a a student telling the teacher the dog ate my homework. You see, the student's admitting he doesn't have his homework, but he can explain what happened. The dog ate it. Even the opponents of Jesus admitted the tomb was empty. Everyone implicitly or explicitly conceded the body is gone. The real question is this, how did the tomb get empty? Listen, the Romans weren't going to steal the body. They wanted Jesus dead. The Jewish leaders weren't going to steal the body. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. The disciples weren't going to steal the body. They didn't have the motive, the means, or the opportunity because we have sources outside the Bible that tell us that they led lives of deprivation and suffering as a result of their proclamation that the tomb was empty. So affirmative evidence is clear and convincing. No objection can be put, can put that body back in the grave. That tomb was empty. 
There's no doubt about that. So here's what we've looked at. The execution, the death of Jesus, the early evidence, writings that came out, accounts that came out too early to be legend, too early to turn into myth. And we have an empty tomb that even the opponents of Jesus conceded that it's empty. But here's the last thing I would share with you this morning as we close our case together. It's the eyewitness accounts. Our prosecutor gleefully stated that here in 2021, we have no eyewitness accounts. And quite frankly, in most investigations of the ancient world, you're lucky to have one, maybe two eyewitness accounts. We have more than nine ancient accounts inside and outside of the Bible. Let me give them to you quickly. One, we got the creed. We talked about that earlier. Coming perhaps as a matter of weeks after the resurrection of Jesus, Jewish New Testament scholar Pincus Lapid said this, the creed may be considered as a statement of eyewitness. Eminent professor of the New Testament, Richard Bachman, said this, there can be no doubt that Paul is citing the eyewitness testimony of those who were recipients of resurrection appearances. Secondly, Paul's testimony about the disciples. You find it in 1 Corinthians 15, 11, when he said, therefore, whether it was I or they, we preached it, you believed it. Thirdly, you've got the book of Acts written by Luke, which seemed to be a first century investigative reporter and a close companion to Paul. And what we have there is the teachings of the disciples summed up in their sermons in Acts chapter 2. And you know what the central theme of all of those sermons are? Jesus has risen from the dead. Just a few weeks after crucifixion, Simon Peter said this in Acts chapter 2, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, being delivered by the, and determined the purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified him and put him to death whom God has raised, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it, death. And then verse 32 says, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. And those witnesses were confirmed when 3,000 people got saved that day and believed the story that they were being told and the church erupted into existence. The fourth through the seventh source are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Craig Evans, Craig Evans, a New Testament theologian, said this, There's every reason to conclude that the Gospels have fairly and accurately reported the essential elements of Jesus' teaching, his life, his death, and his resurrection. They're early enough, they're rooted into the right streams that go back to Jesus and the original people. There's continuity, there's proximity, there's verification, and there's certain distinct points with archaeology and other documents, and I love what he says here, and then there's inner logic. And while those preceding seven sources are of the New Testament, we also have two that are outside the New Testament. We have Clement, who sat under the teaching of the apostles, ordained by Simon Peter. Here's what he said. Therefore, having received orders and complete certainty by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and believing in the word of God, they went with the Holy Spirit certainty, preaching the good news that the kingdom of God is about to come. Then the ninth piece of evidence is from Polycarp. Again, we've established he was appointed by John to be the bishop of Smyrna. Here's what he wrote. For they did not love the present age, but him who died for our benefit and for our sake was raised by God. Nine early sources inside and outside the New Testament confirming and corroborating the disciples' eyewitness accounts that Jesus, the Son of God, had backed up his claim by raising alive, seen by over 500 people, talked to them, touched them, ate with them. Some say the disciples were just hallucinating but I would present to you this morning that hallucination is like a dream. They're individual. It's not global. There's no way that they all could have hallucinated what they reported. So what am I here to tell you this morning? Well, the totality of the evidence is overwhelming. You are the jury this morning. You have to decide right now. What's your verdict? 
The, the execution of Jesus, he was dead. The early evidence came too quick to allow it to be a legend. The empty tomb, it, the enemies and the critics all concede that the tomb was empty. And then you have these eyewitnesses that are sources from in and out of the New Testament. You have to understand that the resurrection is the linchpin of Christianity. And lest I leave out the most important part of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's the undeniable evidence of the blood of Christ. And what that has done in the lives of people from that time till now, it has changed lives from then till now. It has changed destinies from then till now. It has brought salvation, healing, and hope from that day until now. So before we close our case, I have three witnesses who sent us video testimony of what that blood shed on that day when Jesus died and resurrected three days later, what it meant to them. Please give your attention to the screens. Jesus healed lepers, those people who had a disease that isolated them from others. A disease that slowly ate away at the life of the victim. A disease that all too often ended in death. I know what it's like to be a leper. The whole world looks at you different. Everyone says you deserve what you got. You chose your path. There was no peace for a leper. Leprosy sufferers remained excluded from society, forced to living outside of villages in communities of similar people like other lepers. What would them places look like today? Places like a riverbank, in a tent, or in a car? Living under a bridge, or in a box on a sidewalk? Maybe an abandoned house, maybe even a state hospital, or a stoplight holding a homeless sign. Maybe the person that's been married more than one time. If we are honest, isn't those the kind of people we were warned as children to stay away from? Those sinners or lepers, to ignore them like they don't exist. For me, leprosy was alcohol and drugs, which led to homelessness and pornography and many other things. My leper spots were so obvious, so embarrassing. I know what it feels like to be put in a leopard camp, excluded from all clean, holy people and have to scream drug addict, drug addict, drug addict, or drunk, drunk, drunk. Leprosy was considered contagious Nobody wanted to be around you. In fact, it was even a law that nobody could touch you or they would become defiled and infected with leprosy. Luke 5, 12 through 13. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Jesus did the same thing for me that he did for this man. He became a leopard. He became sin for me. He took on my sin, my shame, my guilt, and my spots. Through his blood, Jesus delivered me from the leopard camp. I'm like the lady that had the blood issue. She knew that if she would get to touch Jesus, that he could heal her. And she believed that in her heart, and it takes faith to believe. I don't know if she was saved or not, but she got to touch him, and he turned and looked, and he said, who touched me? And of course, the disciples said there were so many people they didn't know. And I'm like her. I feel I'm like her because I had some blood issues like that. I was uh, expecting my second child. He was very small. And uh, I was pretty well, but I had a lot of blood issues. I had a lot of sickness in that time. And I had to go to Maxfield Clinic in Dallas, Texas, and take radiation. I took it for five days, and it didn't help. And I went home, and I was kind of disappointed that it didn't help. And I didn't want to go back because they wanted to do away with my baby and I wasn't gonna go there. I felt I'd carried him this long and I'd, we'd both went through this. I just didn't wanna give him up. And my dad said, well, you need to go try this again. So I went 
and I took three more treatments and they still wanted to do away. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. So I went home and by this time I weighed 86 pounds. I was very weak and I was trying to work because I had my daughter to take care of and had no support. So I just had to do what I had to do. Sometimes I could barely get out of bed to go to work. My dad took me to the hospital and they said, you know, if he hadn't have brought me, I wouldn't be here by morning. You know, the Lord knew me then. I didn't know him, but I, I still prayed because I believe in prayers. I've always believed in prayers. So I prayed that the Lord would, you know, have mercy on me and my child. So my baby was born that night and he weighed two pounds and 15 ounces, but I still kept the other issue. And one evening I went to see the baby and he, I was holding him and I was talking to God. And I said, Lord, if it's, if we're not to be here, just take both of us home. But then I remembered that I had another child and I had to keep going for both of them. And you know, he's so merciful and caring that he loved me so much, even when I didn't know him, that he took care of me and my children. My son is now 50. He's okay. But you know, it's just troubles that you have to go through. But if you believe in the Lord, he can bring you through anything. He's always there to take you through. He takes you through the valleys and he takes you through the mountains. And I praise him for all of that. In the Bible, we learn about a character named Mary Magdalene, who Jesus cast seven demons from. In a lot of ways, my story relates to her. From a very early age, I struggled a lot with depression and anxiety, toxic relationships, shame and guilt, and a lot of anger and hate. For a long time, those were never ending battles every day. Eventually to the point of me having no desire to even live my own life anymore. A lot of time spent seeking myself and my identity in the next toxic relationship that was destined to fail. It's been a few years in and out of many doctor's offices with many different prescriptions. And I think at my worst, I was on six different psychiatric medicines a day. Just trying to feel anything, any kind of emotion, alive, anything. None of that worked. I found myself really desperate, really alone, and in a church by myself. And for the first time in a lot of years, that was the only time I felt anything. Jesus saved me. The love of Jesus saved my life. This case is hard for me because it's personal. To think that I have the responsibility of defending the case for Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the evidence has been presented. The people that you have seen, they're not actors. They're real people. I'm going to introduce them to you in just a minute. 
But I need you to understand that that blood touched my life. Because I once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was blind, but now I see. Old things have passed away. And through Christ's blood that was shed on the cross, that confirmed he was the Son of God as he rose from the dead, it changed my life. It changed my life. And it changed my eternity. So I'm going to ask Josh Wilkerson, Irene Wentz, and Elena Wall, if they will just come and stand here at the bottom of the steps and kind of face our congregation for just a moment. This is not easy for them to do. Because the tendency for people to hear those kinds of stories is to look at these people differently now. But they aren't different. They're still blood-bought children of God. And this morning, some of you identified with their stories. Whether it's the leper, the woman with the issue of blood, or Mary Magdalene. You identified with that. And some of you that identified with that are skeptics about whether Jesus really did all this for you. And I'm here to tell you, he did it for you. Here's the deal. Here's my closing argument. If God took the very worst thing that could have ever happened, the death of his son, and turned it into the best thing that could have ever happened, salvation, healing, and hope for us, then what problem, what circumstance, what challenge, what mistake, what weakness do you think he can't overcome in your life? So a good juror always reaches a verdict, and it's time for yours. Before you leave this morning, you're going you're gonna to make a verdict. You're going to choose to either believe or not, and the choice is yours. But let me say this. The resurrection is not a legend. It's not mythology. It's not make-believe. It's not fairy tale. It's not wishful thinking. <laughs> it was a historical reality that can change your life. Pray with me, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this day where we celebrate a risen Savior. Thank you for the evidence, unequivocal evidence that we have of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the early reports. Thank you for the eyewitness accounts. Most of all, thank you for what it has meant to our lives as our lives have been changed by the blood of Christ. So this morning, let us struggle with where we are at in our verdict. Will we believe or will we continue to be the skeptic? You left us with that choice, a choice that we've got to make now. So help us, Lord, I pray in Christ's name. Keep your heads bowed for just a moment. Simple question. Are you in a right relationship with Jesus Christ? He made it possible by going to the cross being buried, resurrecting from that grave. He made it possible for us to be restored back into right relationship with God the Father. But he left that choice up to you. You have to make a verdict and you have to do it today. If you're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, I can't think of a better day than today to be the first day of the rest of your life. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. It's been a year since since I've asked anybody to come to the altar. But I'm going to do that today. If you're here and you're not in a right relationship with Christ, we've got three people that know what it is to accept the Lord and to let him change your life. And I'd love for you to come to this altar and let us pray for you. But the choice is yours. I'm going to ask Linda to sing this chorus through a couple times. As she sings, you're not in a right relationship. Would you just come to the altar? Somebody else. Somebody else.
going to wait. Sing it again, Linda. keep singing it. I, I just think there's one more. I mean, we had three stories. So we've got two people responding. I just think there's one more. So sing it another time. Let's see what happens. If you're not in a right relationship, now's the time.
not dismiss. You can just leave whenever you're ready to leave. If you don't have a home church, we'd love for you to come back next week and join us at 9.30 or 11. But here, here's what I want to say. They're just going to keep singing. And, and if you didn't get what you needed, we're going to hang around. We're just going to hang around until you get what you need. If you, if you didn't get prayed for and you want prayed for, we want to pray for you. I, I know it felt so good to do that after a year. I mean... We were just putting a glove on the end of a broomstick and touching people with it, but now we can hug people and touch. So just want them to sing us out. I'm not going to dismiss you. When you're ready to go, you go. If you need prayer, let's pray.